Hello, hello, Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is an Indie Talk Week, and that means I have my good friend and co-founder, Nicholas Bugs, with me, as well as our esteemed guests, Daryl Fannin and Austin Royal. Gentlemen, say hello. 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 Yeah, you see, Austin was waiting. I, I, I love this, man. He's like, Chris gets us every time. He's like, there's three people in the room, and he's going to be like, gentlemen, say hello. Just talk over yourselves. It's all good. Like... <laughs> Well, we can do that. We can play that game. I'm so disappointed in you, Nick. Ah, dude, I wait. I give the floor no, to no, the no. guests because they're no. esteemed, as you said. You're so, <laughs> again, once again, they told me you were this great thing. You're supposed to be this great thing, and yet you don't notice this nuance. I purposely did no pregnant pauses for you. I know. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank and you. And you said my name first. Yes. And yes. yes. And I purposely said, gentlemen, say hello, instead of what oh. I normally do, which is say, right. Nick. Daryl, Austin, say hello. And then when this I do it true. that way, it forces people to try to race to see right. who gets to say hello first. And that was my personal test to see who the alpha person was. But uh -oh. now I'm over it. Right. Now <laughs> I just say everything. Yeah, stop with the psychological say warfare, bro. Like, yeah, that, we, don't say get, everything we don't have together. time for that. So see, Daryl, Austin, I thought he was going to say, see, I said gentlemen, which doesn't include you, Nick. Gentlemen, say hello, and you too, Nick. <laughs> right, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. Something, something like that. I would do that to Papa Bear, but I wouldn't do that to you. I appreciate you. He's I a swashbuckler you. from way back in the day. He understands. Right? Yeah, you might. Um, get I, 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 I did want to just start by asking you guys before we get into Kino Studios and everything you're all about. What? does it mean to you to make it? I mean, the name of this podcast is Make It. And it started with that question. And this audience may not have heard us ask that in sort of recent episodes, but we want to get back to it because it's our namesake. And it still remains a powerful question because making it to every creative means something different. So just curious, what would it mean? And I know Nick is as well. What would it mean for you guys to make it? What does it mean to make it to you? Uh, you know, that's really interesting. I think when I first came to LA and started my career back in 2014, I said, I would have said to make it would be able to, I don't know, work with some amazing people at the top of the industry and, you know, um, have my work displayed for people to see. I think that would have been amazing to me if I could have worked with people that I loved and respected and had it, you know, distributed worldwide, that would have been it. Um, fast forward a few years. Uh, I think that making it to me now looks like uh, helping everyone get their material out there, but also do it in an equitable way. I'm tired of mm. looking and seeing people who are creating valuable projects uh, walk away hungry, like losing their homes because of strikes and all the rest. So to me, making it isn't just about me anymore. It's about a community of people. And there's a system that actually works. That's what it means to me to make it. Boom. Yeah. I love it. Austin. I mean, so what's interesting here is Daryl and I are two sides of a coin. Um, we actually just host our first award show at the DGA and we gave a speech to our 800 plus guests. We're very lucky to have uh, the finest of LA's film and tech communities come together. And that's really Daryl and I. So Daryl is an amazing writer and executive producer who has worked with the top um, folks, folks you've never heard of, like Jimmy Kimmel and Matt Damon and Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I am a three-time tech founder. I know, right? You know, just never heard of those guys. But um, right. I'm a three-time tech founder and entertainment lawyer. So I kind of sit on the opposite side. So for me, I get to support. I, that's sort of the role I've, I've played, building technology, being a lawyer in those roles. And so for me, when I look at what does it mean to make it, for me personally, it is empowering filmmakers through technology and systems that are built for them. Um, but more broadly, I think uh, what I get excited by is empowering the next generation of stories to be told and, 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 and facilitating the ability for more stories to be told. Film and TV is such an incredible medium to inspire, to innovate, to, to allow us to feel something, to laugh, to cry, to impact social change. And if we can empower more stories to be told by eradicating inefficiencies and inequitability, then I know that Daryl and I will feel like we've made it. And I know our filmmakers will feel like they've made it because their stories are going to be seen by millions of people. They're going to get paid fairly. And, and we're going to be fixing a lot of issues that are core to a beautiful, beautiful industry. Man, Chris, I'm about to reach through this camera, bro, and just give some hugs. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just reach out. It, it's just one of those things where you guys, you're speaking our language, right? I think Chris will echo this. Like, you're speaking our language. I mean, think about the name of the podcast. 
we've come from the same place that you have, right? We've seen some of these inefficiencies. We've seen the lack of, um, of inclusion, equity, all the different things. We've seen the sharks in the water that are coming after the filmmaking minnows. Like we've seen all of this. And that was really what started this podcast in general was just like, this can't be guys. Like we have to get the word out. We got to warn people, educate people, get people who've been there, done that to provide advice, insight, their experiences, because that's, we're doing the same thing, right? It's no longer about us. It's about what we can do for the community. So like just a, my follow-up question to you guys is like, what, what flipped the script? Like what happened? Like what happened to you that yeah. said, you know what? <laughs> It can't be about me anymore. Like this problem is bigger than me. What yeah. happened? What was, what was the thing? What was the catalyst? You know, um, I mean, I have a really long story to get to this point, but we'll fast forward and just say that while I, I really thought that I made it, when I sold my own show to Netflix, I was halfway through my master's program. Matt Damon literally FaceTimed my mom and dad to tell them that we sold the show. I was like, wow. fuck it. I've done it. I've made it. You know, <laughs> I get to right. write, act, and executive produce my own show. This is it. I'm on the top. It's never going to change. You know, like, right. this is the, the dream. Um, and I was so very fortunate and had some incredible people champion me. Um, but what was interesting is that, you know, that show got canceled. I didn't get paid for about six months worth of work. I watched vendors not get paid for weeks and weeks of work. I have a, a good friend of mine uh, who had to uh, pack up and move out because multiple shows had just ended in a way that was not, uh, financially feasible. And so I was watching my friends and this is all before the strikes the strikes made everything infinitely worse, but I was just watching my friends and make these movies that would go out and they'd make a bunch of money, but still the movie lost money. So it'd be a $3 million movie and bring in $6 million in distribution. It's still not profitable. Like that math wasn't mathing for me. Yeah, and yeah. I just saw, I just saw the writing on the wall. And when I reached out to Austin, this is, you know, pre strikes and everything, but I was just like explaining to him the problems that I had seen and my friends had seen. And we started jamming around how we saw technology solving that. And we got really excited because Austin, I think, you know, was probably a little bit more, and you know, he was going to USC and he was getting the education and seeing how, you know, those great lawyers screw over artists in the contracts. <laughs> but before that experience in education, I think everybody's perception is, oh, if you're on TV, you're making a bunch of money. And so it was like literally firsthand seeing my friends on seven seasons of TV as a series regular, having to go to a coffee shop to pick up a job to make ends meet while their, while their episodes were airing because they were owed money and not getting paid. Wow. I, it was just too much. I was, I was frustrated and I, I saw that it was a broken system. And I thought like, initially I was pretty selfish. I was like, oh, I'm going to go just do this for myself. And then as Austin and I started talking, we realized there's an opportunity to empower a lot of people with these tools. Yeah. I love it. I'm curious, yeah, awesome. Austin, since, since Daryl brought it up, what is an example of of a great contract and what are the tenets of a contract where you're really getting screwed? And I mean, you don't, you don't have to like break yeah. down this, like, isn't a class yeah. in law, like, yeah. but if you, if you give three tenets of a good contract and three yeah. tenets of a bad contract, that'd be great. Well, that, that's a dangerous question to ask me. Daryl knows that I am a huge geek. And if I could sit down and give you a lecture on entertainment law, I would do that. Um, mm -hmm. I would it. say now three, for it. Yeah, <laughs> three. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, three right. tenants of a great contract. I mean, it really does depend on who it's for. Um, so if you are talents, if you're, you know, if you are the writer, if you are the director, if you are the producer. So it's a bit of a complex question. But if I could sort of take a bird's eye view and say, what are three great tenants? I would say one that your rights are secured in perpetuity in the art that you create. And in, in many ways, and then that's that's going to be very high level, and I can't the specifics of how that works. But but there are quite a few folks who work on an amazing film or show and then find out that they actually don't have any rights to any quote unquote royalties. We don't actually use the term royalty in film and TV. We tend to use the term backend um, mm -hmm. or residuals. Um, some of these terms are a bit archaic now, but uh, so make sure that you have a right to the work that you've done uh, continuing forward. Um, I would say that the second tenet is that it is equitable, that you are being compensated fairly and that that compensation is something that is rewarding you for a job well done um, I think that the third thing is probably also clarity, um, which is notorious in entertainment law contracts. And, and it, so it, it, lawyers argue it's the beauty of it is that the complexity is built to, uh, to advantage some and to disadvantage others. And so we have a concept called the waterfall, uh, 
uh, which is in any agreement. And if you do have any rights to back in, your position in that waterfall might be to the point where there aren't any drops dripping anymore. Niagara has turned into air vapors. Right. And yep. <laughs> because, you know, this person took this and this person took that. And, and by the time any any finances trickle down to you, there's nothing left. And, and it can be very daunting um, to approach such a complex legal document. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, those those sort of three areas, you know, perpetuity, um, equitability, and clarity, I think are probably the three core tenets I would look for. I think those are huge. And it's the Parapasu sort of positioning of the waterfall that is yeah. so critical on gross profits versus versus net. That's net yeah. that that, yeah. that kind of can trip you up. Um and then there was one I remember we were negotiating a contract one time, but we didn't have the final say, which was just too bad. And there was this term in the contract that talked about bankruptcy from the distributor. Mm. And there were two clauses to like two legal precedents for the bankruptcy. So let's just call it, you know, F 100 a and F 100 B. I don't remember the actual numbers. So yeah. F 100 a meant that when, if, if the company the distributor goes bankrupt, then the rights to your movie go to the, to the acquiring party or sort of go to go somewhere. And the second one F 100 B meant that it went, rolled back to the filmmaker, the original rights owner. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, this distributor has that first one in there. And I, we were telling our producing partners like, Hey, like, you need to no. fight for this one. This is one you That's have right. to fight for. They're like, no, we don't want to die on this hill. I'm like, this hill is where you die. <laughs> <laughs> like, like these, these companies go out of business all the time. This is yeah. like a, this is like a, a services contract distributor. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, to be transparent, this distributor has not gone out of business and is doing okay, doing well, but it's just little things like that where, you know, you have, I guess you just have to get Austin. You have to get a lawyer yeah. um, because, <laughs> Absolutely. because the, the resistance to us in this podcast, uh, Daryl, for example, is I just want to do the creative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not even interested in the business side of this. Yeah. Somebody else needs to do that for me, or I need to find somebody I can trust that'll just yeah. do it all for me. But I think it's helpful for everybody to know it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, sorry, not to speak uh, on over top of you, Austin, but when no, I no, no. came to the industry, I had that exact uh, point of view. I was like, I'm going to be the creative. I don't have to worry about the business stuff. I don't have to worry about, you know, the, the legal contracts. I have a great team. And then what ended up happening on my first show is that the, uh, pilot that was written wasn't acknowledged they ended up taking our ip from us like it was just mm. like we were we were completely uh disempowered and this is on a union show this is on a wga show i'm a wga member and yet still uh with the contracts that be because they are so complex and, and one of my favorite stories about that austin tells is that you know uh, the basic premise of a contract is also simplicity the, the simpler the terms the more clarity right and so these are extremely ridiculously drawn out clauses with a bunch of extra language and you think, oh, I heard the word gross, I'm fine. And then you find out it's adjusted gross and adjusted gross can mean mm -hmm. pretty much whatever the hell yeah. they want it to mean. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's this very, very frustrating thing that you don't even know what to look out for. And even if you have someone in your corner who you trust, who provides that great outside counsel, which I totally recommend that you find, if you are walking in uneducated, you can't be informed about your career. And that's the real problem. If you don't understand the mechanics of the business of this industry or the legal contracts of this industry, you're always going to be a victim to the information that you don't have. Uh, awesome. You can, I saw your No, no probably really like well the, said. If I, if I could have a fourth point, control your destiny. And that can sometimes be very difficult to do in a contract. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't necessarily matter the role. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, we work with hundreds of filmmakers, you know, rapidly scaling as a, as a technology company backed by some of the biggest tech investors in the world. We're, we're scaling to, to work with thousands of filmmakers. And something I do see quite a bit is, you know, to, to what you were talking about earlier, Chris, I mean, a lot of people will sign these contracts where it really is services have been promised, but legally there's really no certainty in that. And so mm -hmm. then you as producer or whoever else being involved, and if you are in a position to try to carry this film to the heights of success, if you don't have the tools to be in control of your own destiny and you don't have the rights to be in control of your own destiny, mm -hmm. well then often this film or series, depending on where you're at, 
can be sort of wrenched out of your hands and you're sitting by just watching as other people are controlling the destiny of that beautiful piece of art that you created. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you can then maintain sort of control of your own destiny, that that's great. Maybe if you're an actor, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're on the production side, but you know, that could come back to back end things like promoting, you know, things like, uh, you know, at the end of the day, having some say in, in how this thing is marketed and gone out to the world, you know, this, it is a team effort. It's not to say that everyone is involved, uh, but I, I often see that, you know, in, in contracts as well, where it's sort of, you know, oh, I'm just here to sort of sit idly by and people tend to just agree to those terms. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the world is so broad. And, and when you agree to that, just look, just look out this, this whole saga that you talked about, Daryl reminds me of a friend of the podcast, Travis Nicholson's experience when he created the show Steal the King for a CMT. And that show was, I, I think they attempted to, to rip that out from under him and give it to, I, I guess, another friend of ours, Potsy, but, and, and Shannon, but the, that's, that's a tough one for us. But, but, but <laughs> the, the whole thing is that it, it can get sticky contractually. I, I am curious though, Daryl, did, did your experience lead you to Austin? Or did oh, that's, Austin that's a find great his question. way to you? That is, that is a good question. No, no, Daryl found his way to me. I'm going to butt in now. Yeah, um, I like that. Tell Darryl, story, Darryl, Austin. Daryl, Daryl, Daryl. No. <laughs> um, I was actually at my last startup. Um, we had created, of all things, a meme coin. Um, okay. Like this, so this would be like like a Doge coin, for example. Like a Doge coin, yeah. Or like we a Shibu were, Inu. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was called Elongate. It was actually one of the most viral coins of the year alongside Doge. Oh, coin. Elongate uh, coin. Shibu Me and Papa Bear were just yeah, talking about yeah, Elongate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's so, crazy. so I was one of the founders of, of Elongate. Um, we reached mm. over 500,000 investors, 500 million market cap. It started just on a whim. I met some random dudes and gals on Discord and Reddit. We thought it was funny that Elon Musk tweeted if there's ever a scandal about me called Elongate. Um, and we said, Hey, let's create a cryptocurrency because that's what all the cool kids are doing. Not the cool kids, that's what all the geeks were doing. Right. And if we ever make any money, we'll donate all the proceeds to charity. And we okay. thought, No one's going to buy this stupid thing, but elongate is a very funny word, you know, why not? Um, and so we did. And 500,000 beautiful idiots also loved it. Um, Daryl was one of those beautiful idiots that invested yes, in this token. Yeah. And, and oh, we donated yeah. millions of dollars to charity. I mean, it, it was it was a beautiful, beautiful project. We built the team to 50 full-time staff, 200 volunteers worldwide. The point of that story is not that Elongate is the next savior of humanity via technology. Um, it was a really cool uh, journey for me. It led me to Daryl. Daryl reached out to me on LinkedIn with a very sketchy message. It was a little like, <laughs> you know, that's hey, true. You <laughs> and, uh, because Elongate uh, had donated, we, we donated a quarter million dollars to Autism on the Spectrum fundraiser that Jimmy Kimmel was a part of. Daryl was writing with Jimmy Kimmel at the time. And so his worlds collided. I didn't know who the heck Daryl was. He reached out. And he was like, hey, man, would love to chat. And for some reason, for some reason, I said yes. And we went and we chat. Wow. We sat at a little <laughs> yeah, coffee just, shop. Yeah, yeah. That, did, that, that word. We did that, too. Hours. You know, we were there for right. five hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we were there for a long time. Um, That's coffee. A lot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Little, little coffee shop in Hollywood and started jamming. And um, I actually grew up in love with film and TV. I wanted to be a film actor. So I grew up training to be an actor, you know, I, I did everything from theater to films, you know, I worked heavily sort of as an actor, you know, while I was growing up as a kid, nothing sort of prominent by any means, but that was my world. I was just a kid in Ohio doing all sorts of local productions, praying that someday I can make it to LA. I gave that up when my parents' business went under, we lost everything. And I decided to go become a lawyer because it felt like a position where I could fight against injustice. There was basically my parents' business went under. There were a lot of lawyers. And I remember being like, why didn't the lawyers fix this? You know, like my little sisters, you know, my mom, my parents divorced. They were stuck, you know, single mom, three little sisters. I remember just being so angry, being like, there were lawyers involved. The lawyers should have fixed this. Now my family is in a bad position. So I decided to go become a lawyer. And so when Daryl and I met and he started mm -hmm. saying, hey, man, my people, my people, fellow artists in this industry are being, you know, screwed over by just an old system. And it's, yep. you know... <laughs> We, we're in the 2020s and, and, and the internet exists and there are people, there are billions of people on it and they want to see this art. And yet at the end of the day, it's so, so hard to get your art out to the world. And it's so hard to not just get it out there, but also to just get paid for creating it. <laughs> there has to be a better solution. And so we sat down and started chatting. 
and it just lit a fire in me because that was my first love. I then went and, you know, found a tech company, studied to become a lawyer and just our worlds colliding together led to the beautiful birth of uh, an amazing mission that turned into a vision that turned into a beta app that turned into a full fledged app that turned into a, a company that's raised over $4 million that has some of the biggest tech investors in the world and a team of 15 amazing people uh, that are supporting us in hundreds of films that we're launching. Um, this year and next. So um, also, that was how we met the, and that's where we're at today. You might be the Segway King. I'm like over here, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so, so how do we then move the conversation and talking about Kino Studio and, and what yeah. Kino Studio does? And he was like, here you go, Nick, let me just I got put you. that on a plate for you. So so that's that's the next thing, right? So we, we've, we've yeah. talked about what it means to make it, talked about your amazing backgrounds, but really like, let's talk about how we're going to change the game together. Right. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we're in the same mission. Like, this is what we do. Like, if you guys are doing this for the filmmakers and, and that's our community, that's our friends, that's our family out there. Like, we're willing to, you know, raise that flag and let people know, like, this is where we need to go. So just give us yeah. the insight, man. Let us know how Kino Studio is going to change the game yeah. for filmmakers out there. I mean, I, I'll say it simply and then you can add flavor. We're, we're a data driven digital premiere app for filmmakers to launch their films to millions of fans all over the world digitally. We've actually invented a new legal watch window called LVOD Plus, Live and Video On Demand Plus. So you might know SVOD, like Netflix, you might know AVOD, like Tubi, you might know ETT, where you download to own, or sometimes called DTO. You might know PVOD, which is Premium Video On Demand. That one's kind of a misnomer. You might know TVOD, <laughs> which is Transactional Video On Demand. We are LVOD, and so we introduce a live premiere where your fans can all log on to Kino and watch the cast and crew talk about the amazing film as it's premiered for the first time to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of fans. Um, it adds a new area for monetization. And we have a whole suite of tools to empower the filmmaker to take the friction and the pain out of things like marketing, out of things like immediate payouts, out of things you know like data that actually gives you unique insights into what the platform is. There, uh, you know, take it away. I mean, you nailed it, dude. I don't know. There's not a lot to add. I'll just like we all know that the sales distribution funnel is broken fundamentally. If you went to Sundance this year, if you if you've taken a movie to the festival, honestly, in the last five years, you know that we are on a very difficult journey as an industry because we have. Uh, we have left behind a lot of the basic principles of business, uh, which is really, really difficult. So like, you know, if you're trying to market your film right now, it makes absolutely no sense to go and spend money on billboards and radio ads and all of these things that we do because it drives general awareness and it's great for the ego, but it's doing shit when it comes to actually putting butts in seats and converting eyeballs. And what really is frustrating for us is we're not even following like the best practices that YouTubers used in 2010 to market. Mm -hmm. Like, like it is really incredibly to, uh, incredible to me how these digitally native individuals who grew up on TikTok or grew up on YouTube know how to market and monetize their audience, but established filmmakers don't even know how to market. And so they put that power in the hands of individuals like you know their distributors who may or may not understand the film that they're marketing and the audience that they're marketing to and it's why podcasts like this you know you have you know your audience you know who your family is and who's listening it's the filmmakers a lot of times you know uh distributors distributors are generally buying information to try and figure out who this is and they're just saying oh well, we're just going to market to all 18 to 34 year old females because that's the demographic that loves this type of film and it completely misses the audience that's actually there to show up for the film yeah well it's, you just, really you just well, mentioned something really well yeah you just mentioned something that's been um you know I, I guess i could call it the p underneath my mattress you know it's like <laughs> your the, crawl nick is your yeah, crawl, exactly <laughs> has your, has your crawl been my stuck? Crawl, bro like and, and this is the thing you guys are you me have this. you been plogged <laughs> that's a word we invented a couple weeks ago. Right. Right. So, so, so here's the thing. And, and Austin, guys, like you push back on me and Chris too, if, if I'm way off. Okay. But you mentioned the industry and look like that word has been bugging me like for probably mm. two weeks because, and this is why you said industry has gotten away from some of the fundamental principles of business. Mm -hmm. Right. So here's my pushback to that. So I agree. So it's like a yes and. My yes and is that businesses serve people 
in order to make the business owners money. And that's what a business does, right? It serves yep. people 100%. in order to make the business owner money. Or serves businesses. In, but, yeah. but industry feeds itself. Mm. Its whole purpose is to sustain itself. It's not for service, right? It's not what that's for. Its intention is to survive. So if I have to burn you down or do something, like it doesn't matter. It doesn't care. It's about making money yeah. on the backs of businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So the film industry is makeup artists. It's laundromats. It's taxi services. It's actors. It's lighting. It's literally all of these things. It is an industry that exists to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. So just like social media, right? It started out as this great business, as a service, right? I give you access to your friends and your family and I do it for free and I do it. But no, now it's like, no, how can I monetize you to sustain myself? Yeah. And I think that's the key for me with folks like you it isn't how do we fix or change the industry? Because if you try that, you lose, you fail by default. It's like, no, how do we create a business, right? Because you need to sustain yourself as a, as a business owner that actually serves, that its intention yep. is to serve the population that your service or product was engineered for. Yes, I think what's really interesting, and maybe this is semantics, but I agree with you completely. And when I think about the industry and the way that it needs to be changed, I think the way that we change the industry is by servicing people again. And I think the problem is, to your point, like it's not about economic activity. It's about human beings. So That's when you right, have 100%. a work culture that is toxic, like it blows my mind that a certain streamer, the CEOs, author papers about work culture that is so very important to them that they, they want to like make a big deal about it. But then when you go work on the films that mm. we're in that same ecosystem, the, the culture is extremely toxic. It's the antithesis of everything that they say in their beautiful little papers. And so for us, when I look at the two sides of our, our app, we have two businesses uh, that, that we're really focusing on. And one is filmmakers. That's our primary focus is building technology for those filmmakers. We want to make the industry more efficient and more equitable for them because that's the future for us. Those are the people that we want to take care of. On the other side is the fans. We want to create a film and TV landscape that isn't just like dumping a bunch of shit on a library and it gets lost in the chaos. You want to create an yep. experience that makes this stand out. And we want to bring the magic back to filmmaking. And I think that to your point, it's learning to service the values of those two individuals and connect those two individuals where we're going to see a real change. And, and that new business model will change the industry fundamentally because if you're getting a ton more value as a fan on this platform and you're getting a ton more value as a filmmaker on this platform, that is what the industry is. And that supports artists. That supports the laundromats. That supports the guys who are printing the, the signs and the PAs and everybody right. in that ecosystem. That's awesome. You know, it's interesting you know, I, I won't push back on it. I do agree. I thought it was really well said, Nick. So, so kudos to you. I, I, I'm thinking about where we are with the industry for, for change to happen. The industry has to be not working. It has to be broken. And there are a lot of people that come on our podcast and that we talk to that say, Hey, the industry is broken, <laughs> Yeah. but the reason why we have this really, and the same thing is was true of the music industry for a long time. They were running off Tin Pan Alley uh, business model up until Steve Jobs basically had a and 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 the oh, uh, Sean Parker Parker who invented Napster had a gun to their head and they had to change their model. But that model ended up being worse for artists than they could have imagined, unless you're in yeah. the top one percent. Yep. Yeah. Um, so someone else was on the take there and they did, they, you know, yeah. the label sort of gave it all up to them because they were, they were broken. And I don't know if film is actually broken enough uh, to change because here we are in 2024 with all this technology and why can't anybody fix it? And I look at, and so I, I will use crypto as an example since we have Austin on, right? Crypto didn't say to itself, how do we fix the financial industry? It said, we're going to create an alternative and it's going to be so good 
and it's going to be so uh, accessible and it's going to be such an interesting store of value that people are just going to do it, Nick. They're just going to go yeah. do it. It's going to be, That's it. and we're going to see if we can ride free of financial industry, of regulation, as far as we can go and, and keep it afloat. And they've had their bruises and they've taken beatings for Sam Bankman Freed and for CZ and, and, and some of the things Binance has gone through and, and the NFT grifters and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, everything else has come with it. But at the end of the day, right now, Bitcoin is $52,000 a coin. And I do think people crave simplicity. They want, yeah. there will be uh, uh, almost an m a type of shrink of that industry because people want to just know, okay, is Bitcoin store of value? Is it Tether? Is it USDC? Like, what is it, right? And yeah. I think I look at Elon as well. So you brought up Elon Musk, Austin. Like, how is he, how did he revolutionize rockets? Well, NASA was completely broken. We had not done, we, there was no flights to the International Space Station that could happen in the U.S. because we were so bureaucratic. They're all coming out of Russia and China. So he just built a company and said, you should pay me. I can do it for less. And we'll and we'll get um, space exploration back being a United States thing. And so I just wonder if that's not really the answer, Nick, is that they're still making money hand over fist. So in their eyes, they're good. Yeah, what's broken well, that's, that's, is well, that's, us, that's the workers, the people yeah. inside. We're the ones that have the horror stories. We're, yeah. you know, I always bring up the guy who still hasn't got any money from from Men in Black <laughs> that yeah, wrote, yeah, co wrote yeah. Men in Black. Like, yeah. you know, so it's not broken for them. It's broken for us. Yeah, but you're, you're that's what I'm saying. You're saying what I'm saying, right? Which is like, don't try to fix that. Create well, this, a, there's right? A like that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but but maybe you need to build a whole nother industry. Well, yeah. I think yeah, I, I mean, think that, there's that's the, definitely yeah, how we I think see that's it. where they're yeah that's where they're okay. going. Okay, that's, okay. that's yeah, the beauty yeah. of it. I, I mean, think like that's yeah, exactly we we, we look at we look at you know it, the world is so different than it was in the 30s when film was first invented. Also, I think that we need to realize, unlike music, music has been around for a long time. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, film is a very new medium. It's mm -hmm. a very new technology in all of humanity. We have not had motion pictures, save for the last hundred plus mm -hmm. years and really I don't even the think way it's that 100, we know them today is it austin yeah yeah, yeah. i don't I think mean, it's a hundred years old yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i think you're right i mean if you if you count some of those really cryptic you know first sort of like photography and sort of you know the way they did but yeah i mean less than a hundred years old it's a very new young industry that is going through significant growth pains and cycles and and one of them right now though i think is that we see that we have the internet and that is shocking the system we have content all over the internet today. It could not be easier to find mm -hmm. a film. And that yeah. film could be your grandma holding her cat, right? <laughs> right. That, that would have been on Our favorite short film from the, the National 30s. Film Festival, Austin, was two grandmas, <laughs> two Chinese grandmas in a room. That's it's, awesome. And, and yeah, that's awesome. Disney bought it. So you're dead Disney on. I mean, you couldn't be more spot yeah. on. Yeah. It could yeah. be your grandma but, but holding for, the but cat. But for some reason, yeah. but for some reason, even though we have the internet, even though seemingly in the click of one, you can watch any video anywhere at any time, Seemingly, uh, I'll, and I'll push back on what you said before, actually, uh, they're not making money hand over fist. Netflix is the only profitable streamer. They only reached profitability last year. All the rest of them are losing $10 billion plus every mm -hmm. year. They that's, are losing money left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have sort of resorted to the short-termist approach where if we just keep buying up content and keep putting bigger and bigger names in our platform, we'll, we'll, we'll somehow hit a profit. And that's just not true because they're, they're overlooking the fundamental of the art over, over, and to your point before about servicing people, right? At, at the end of the day, it's not about numbers on a spreadsheet. You know, what you were doing is you were telling stories and you're, you're delivering film to the individual. If you're a streaming platform, if you're a tech platform like we are, and if you're not obsessed with your fan experience on the one side, like Daryl said, and you're not obsessed with fostering the most incredible filmmakers and films, then, then, then you're going to end up losing. It will catch up to you. At the end of the day, $15 can't pay for unlimited content. I don't care what yeah. Netflix tells you. The yeah. math doesn't <laughs> math at the end yeah. of the day. And so what we look at is we say, well, but that actually, actually provides the opportunity to look at what was and say, you know what? LVOD, SVOD, ETT, DTO, PVOD, TVOD, like good Lord have mercy. It's gotten crazy. <laughs> it has. Yeah. It's, it, we we it, always say, we Austin, that, that uh, innovation is bundling and then innovation unbundling. again is unbundling <laughs> yes. so you just you just no, bundle it, it and you unbundle over and over is. yeah it absolutely is and so what i love about you know the company that daryl and i have built together 
is that is well beyond us at this point is that we are a mission driven company. And our mission was very simple from the start. We have three E's that we believe in as a company. We believe in efficiency, we believe in equitability, and we believe in engagement. And those are very crucial for the making and delivery of film and television. If you're not efficient in the way that you go, go about it, it's very hard to recoup any financing that you put in it. And it tends to persist a problem of this mantra that film and TV doesn't make money. And so that just makes it so much harder to make your next film or for other filmmakers to make it because everybody thinks it's a money losing business when it's actually not at the end of the day, if done right. And it can actually be a very profitable business which then allows you to tell more stories, which allows you to impact more change in the world. The second, equitability. If everybody isn't aligned together, paid fairly, compensated, if everybody doesn't win together, if there isn't win-win economics at play, that just is its own corrosive mechanism that tends to degrade what is a very beautiful industry. And then the final thing, engagement, if you don't engage the ultimate end user, which is your fans, and they don't feel mm-hmm. excited and they don't feel that magic, at the end of the day, it's just video after video after video after video, then we are reaching a world in which the magic has been lost and the actual impact of the art itself that all of us are in this space to do. None of us woke up and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a film just to go make some money. I don't know a single right. person yeah. that ever says, I'm just in this business to make money. That's it. That's right. Like, there, are a lot, there are a lot easier jobs just to make money. People do <laughs> yep. it because they love it. Yep. And yet for some reason, when it actually gets to the end user as a fan, you go, wait, where's, where's your film? How do I find it? Oh, it's on Netflix. How do I search for it? I didn't know about it. I couldn't click right. easily. Oh, I'm not subscribed to that one, so I can't get it. And so while we can't fix every single problem that's out there, we can just actually, like you said, say, hey, the future actually looks like this and it's bright and beautiful. And we have the power to build that through technology that is mission driven, that the technology isn't built to divide. It's not built to win, lose to the point you were saying, and I think was actually crucial. What's unique about our team is Daryl and I are folks that are from within the industry. If you look at Steve Jobs, not a musician, didn't come from the music industry, but introduced iTunes to the world. Daniel Eck from Spotify. Not from the music industry. He's a tech bro that created the number one app in the streaming space that, like you said, has actually made things worse off, right? Even the founders of Netflix. And by the way, as a tech founder, these are some of the people I respect the most in the world for the amazing companies that they built, their ability to scale, their ability to create incredible business models. Nothing on the tech side of it do I have any qualms with, but it is folks that are from outside of the industry that walked in and said, hey, here's some amazing technology. It's going to change your lives. And then we all woke up a couple of decades later and said, oh my gosh, this just made it worse because $15 doesn't pay for unlimited everything. So somebody has to lose. And, and, and how much is Spotify for about $10 doesn't pay for unlimited everything and somebody has to lose. And so then it mm-hmm. created these win-lose economics that ultimately somebody ends up losing out. And, and we don't have to have win-lose. We can definitely have win-win. And so that's what we believe at, at Kino is actually being mission-driven by doing the right technology that's innovative. We can empower instead of subtract. There's a lot to dig in on that, Nick. I mean, it like, is, like, but Chris, like, is he is, is yeah. Austin even excited about this? I can't even tell, man. You know, like, you know, like, <laughs> no, he's you know, he's not excited. He's passionate, man. Because yeah, one, right, one, one of the things that t- sends uh, investors running for the door is walking in looking like a wild-eyed dreamer. Like yeah, right. you know, <laughs> as a film investor myself, you know, I would I tell creatives don't come in there talking about yourself, make it about them and don't be wild eyed dreamer. Like, you know, go in there and have a plan and be, and be legit. But I want to dig in on it. Cause you do make a great point about the money that's being lost. I suppose there's um, money flow in depending on if you're a publicly traded company or not. And then there's money lost shown based on taxes and tax loopholes that you so Zaslav, for example is a master at at, at this uh who who runs you know hbo and, and and warner now and netflix you're right they they figured out how to be profitable i don't know how much longer they're going to be that way i mean there's only so many people that can afford that subscription a month and to your point paramount i mean they, they want out they i They'll probably be acquired by June, right? Or, or sooner. Paramount Plus is, is going to go away. So you're right on, on, on that. And I, I spoke a little bit too loose there for sure. I guess what I'm thinking about industry wise, and maybe, and so I love what you're doing with Kino. And I, I do wonder though, does there have to be a new category in a, um, that maybe Kino can create? What I mean by that is, um, everybody that we've talked to that, that's tried to change the industry or, or, or say they're going to, you know, do it in a different way. They try to play by the rules mm-hmm. that already exist mm-hmm. because that's yeah. 
the, the industry, but then they try to have their twist on how they're going to do it different, but yeah, they still yeah. played by the same rules that got mm-hmm. them to this place yeah. when you, yeah. and, and so I guess I, I, mean, I wasn't super clear on it. So it's, so it's e me, but, but my, my thinking on it is like, is there a way to through technology specifically create a new way to consume content that satisfies the the end user, the fan, the, the viewer, and uh, is 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 profitable and pays the people who create the content. There's yeah. a lot of tech bros, yeah. like to your point, Austin, that would just say, "Oh, the answer to that is AI. AI yeah. is is, yeah. is 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 how that's going to work." But but I I don't think and that's too general. I, I hear yeah. and and, <laughs> yeah. and it's not ready. It's not there. Yeah. Um, there's well, a I mean, lot of people that you... did a freaking backflip for Sora this week. And I'm like, <laughs> too much. Too, too and many. I keep, I keep, many. I keep tweeting this out or posting whatever it's called now. Like guys, this is actually not good enough for a feature film. This is not actually no. going to work. No, maybe, no, maybe Daryl, an establishing shot. Look, like we're, I think... we're like where you're taking a drone shot, maybe over a city. But what do you yeah. do when you have to edit that? Look, I think that I think that the idea that generative AI is going to provide all the solutions that we need is absolutely ridiculous. And AI will solve a bunch of problems in film and TV mm-hmm. behind the scenes long before it will be generating its own content. So if we want yeah. to look at like well, AI implied solutions, go ahead. Austin also yeah, no, uh, expert in this and has very strong opinions around <laughs> AI as I well. Mean, so we're going to just like a lot of I'd love to hear it. it. No, but like a lot of what's being done in AI is completely illegal. Right? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's a lot of the data that's being fed to these LLMs is copyrighted yeah, and copyrighted cannot actually be used. And so once we actually dive into, whoa, how was this, you know, the, the famous source shot of Tokyo, where was that sourced from? And was yeah, that copyrighted yeah, yeah. content? And guess what? Yeah. If Disney owned part of that, they are going to sue you. And they're going to <laughs> yeah. say, you know, 10% <laughs> of that shot was derived from data that we own. So, so, so it's like we have this, and also at the end of the day, we are reaching a, a point. And, and, and not to bring Elon up again, but Elon was on stage bring at the New York Times it's all good. conference, and in talking about how he believes that now is the most interesting time to live. And if you ever could live at a certain time, you should probably live in the most interesting time, because yeah. today we are actually reaching a point where AI can replace a lot of human function. But the the, the, the approach I take to it, and there's a beautiful book called Utopia for Realists. I highly recommend you check it out. We should be using things like AI and technology to replace functionality that does not service humanity for the positive. That's right. Right. At the end of the day, making the very food that we need to eat to survive probably should be done by robots and AI at some point. Or if you love doing it, keep doing it, but create a niche boutique crazy spot where you're this amazing chef, but just actually getting you fed, right? Or, Or actually... You know, not to not to hate on my accountants out there, but getting your spreadsheets done probably <laughs> could be done by AI. And not to throw my fellow lawyers under the bus, but at some point, that that is an industry where mm-hmm. you know the basics of law could probably be done by AI. Well, why in the world, if we as humans sat down and said, you know what, we should replace, we should replace actors, we should replace artists. It's just too tough. It's too damn tough. We really need technology. So, so at the end of the day, you know, the current economic system that it lives in. Is, is spurring this on. It is very sexy to say AI can take, can create the next Marvel movie and make a billion dollars and it costs us $2 to make it. That is a beautiful proposition. But we are at a point now as humanity, we, we need to make active choices and say technology either serves us or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And, and if technology doesn't serve us, maybe we should choose to not support it. And maybe we should say instead, so to your, to your answer before, you know, what are the ways there are certain, you know, new business models, like we're introducing a business model that allows for more direct revenue streams and monetization to each film. It expands the pie of each film when the pie is shrunk so small. That's one way. Another way that we see as one of the places AI should immediately replace is marketing. Nobody yeah. likes buying ads or creating marketing campaigns. <laughs> and guess what? You're doing it all off your own data set in your own head. AI knows better. It just does. It can review, you know, the past 100 years of data and say, based off historical precedent, the most likely result is that this is the best way to take your film and reach 100,000 people and make $2 million and look, you just turn profitable, right? When we so, started so in Austin, that way, yeah. we, would, um, we would spend 40 hours creating these spreadsheets 
about like what's your target audience. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. What cities? Anyway, go ahead. Keep going. Keep your your role. No, 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 wanna... no, no. It's exact. Yeah. No, it's exactly to that point. Is there are things like that or hang out, everybody. Yeah. You know what? Why? Why? We 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 can have technology that just immediately pays out royalties. It goes to your bank account. It's immediate, easy, done. Even things like data reporting. You as the human should have that at the end point. And so for us on our producer dashboard side, we are building out all these tools to simplify and create efficiency in that process. Because what that does is, for example, Barbie had to spend $100 million to go make a billion dollars. Now, that's great for Barbie. Yeah. But if you're not Barbie and you're Madam Web and you just spent $100 million to make $10 million, <laughs> well, that's not great. And if you're right. actually 90% of film and TV that doesn't have $100 million laying around, the reality <laughs> more is- more than 90%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, 99.9%, it doesn't have $100 million <laughs> lying around, what do you do? Well, the reality is you don't need to spend $100 million. We have the internet. There are 4.01 billion people on it. Use digital tools that are built right, utilize AI to find, target, and acquire your end user, your end fan, and give them the best experience to engage with your art, where they're going to go tell their friends and family, focus on the fan. And so for, for us, it's all about those tools that take out the inefficiencies, that take in, out the inequitability, because then we can actually foster a better economic model, a more innovative model, and something that actually gives some people some joy instead of scrolling through TikTok all day and then trying to find something on Netflix and going to bed sad and tired. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you should be like happy. literally describing last night for me. <laughs> You're right. Well, well, look, but before we hop into some things we should know with producer Papa Bear, I, I, I should just say thank you, producer Joe, for dropping knowledge on us about. So producer Joe, in my ear here, has said first movie looks to have been 1888 or 1878. Oh, shit. That's earlier than I was thinking. The Horse in Motion. The horse in yeah. Motion. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you, That's producer right. Joe. Yeah. But I think I win that one, Chris, then, because you said yeah. under 100. And I wanted to push back, yeah. but you were so confident. Yeah. I was so wait, confident. Wait, wait. Is, is Horse That's in my, Motion, my is primary that Edison? skill? <laughs> yeah. wait, I don't know. When, when, when was Edison? Producer Joe. Edison, yeah, because Edison did it, it the was thing Ed where you have to look through the little yes. square, right? And basically yeah. the whole thing is spinning in order for you to watch the movie, right? Yeah. And oh, it was just yeah. this little tiny bit of light that would come in to enable you to see this thing. And I think I'm checking the, out the, the note. The first film exists. was two seconds, Nick. Does that count? As I mean, a, definitely. As a movie. If I it was take a, a two-second video two of seconds. myself, it's moving. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right. It's a movie picture. Picture. I'm about it. That, so yeah, the movie that would have blown are... people's minds. That's right. It did. Yeah. I probably, probably did. thought it was witchcraft. Someone got, sure. someone got burned to the stake for, yep. right. yeah. for looking at that, probably. That's okay, right. so that would make it like 100 and maybe 50 years old or, or yeah. close to that if it's if it's that old. So correction there. Um, there. I want to talk about a few points you made there, Austin. I want to dig into them a little bit before we go to things we should know with Papa Bear. I, I just want to t say this. and I know Nick is thinking it, too. We could talk to you guys for four or five hours. Like, <laughs> right. this could be a Dan Carlin hardcore history episode. Like, we could go for six hours. This could be yeah. on some Bology shit yeah. where we're like Marathon. talking yeah. forever. Uh, yeah. sh <laughs> shout out to those people who know who Bology is. Um, former, former, uh, I think, uh, C CTO of Coinbase. Uh, okay. So, uh, marketing. There are these people, these people companies now um uh i'm friends with a guy at matter is who's doing this and they are using google's sort of uh adsense infrastructure yeah. mm -hmm. to flood the market with films and shorts and video and content right and then that generates it it, it creates a, a a flywheel for itself to generate mm -hmm. views and cumulative views that are all owned by the same place are all distributed by the same place. And then the, the deal is, okay, 3000 views is $5 roughly it, it changes, but over time you're getting like millions upon millions of views by creating this content. And then you're able to pay out all the creators and pay yourself at the same time as a distributor. I think that's a really awesome model for marketing. Uh, they need about a million dollars to get the wheel going, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's not great, mm -hmm. but uh, they will do it for nothing, but you won't get those big results. But if you can, if you can buy a million dollars of ads and own the vertical, so you need a quant, 
(laughs) right? Who can build it. You need a content creating company, right? That you own or have a partnership with. And then you just need the accounts and you create all these different accounts and and it doesn't. So I love that part. The thing I don't like to your point, Austin, and and Daryl, you may have said this as well. And and maybe even to your point, Nick, a little bit about industry. It's like the problem I have with it is it's still Google's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if Google says, hey, you guys are gaming the system, uh, you, then they can, you literally built your house on sand. It it can be over tomorrow. So good try, but almost. Whereas we look at like Amazon and, and what Bezos did there over the span of many years is he said, okay, publishing is broken. Uh, uh, the way we buy things is broken. No one, I'll just create a new industry where people will buy books. Now you buy everything in there, but Mm -hmm. initially people will buy books online instead of go to the store. And I can eliminate this supply chain and the whole publishing and and, and all these things, this bureaucracy that existed, that that same thing's happening in film where certain people are pushed out, even if they're really good. Yeah. And because they don't know the right people and can't don't have access and everyone laughed at them until they didn't. <laughs> so I like to mention Amazon, I'm going to my pen there. Amazon is a, as a, an example of maybe what Kino can do or what someone needs to do in film and figure out what is that side move. Um, also original sins, next bullet. I have wrote all these things down. Original yeah. sin <laughs> was whoever the person was or whoever the company was that gave the app away for free. Yeah. Whoever Ooh. started giving content away for free, whoever that executive was at the, at the conference table that said, you know what? Those artists aren't really worth. There's all, did we all grow up with a friend like that too? Who was like, <sighs> you know, like what's so special about that? I could do that. Or like, we, yeah. why, why am I paying yeah. for music? Or like, yeah. why are musicians? So they're the same people who ask why LeBron James is a billionaire. Yeah. yeah. Like they don't understand anything. And you're like, LeBron James just, he dribbles a ball. Like, why is he so valuable in the market? It's not about dribbling the ball. And you don't have to understand the complexity of what, how much money he's making for other people. Unbelievably, he is underpaid, right? Yeah. And people you know, who understand that know. Yeah, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist religious cult. So I wasn't allowed to go to the movies or play Can you like, say what that cult is, Daryl? Yeah, I can. Uh, and listen, so the others can avoid it? If anyone else is in here and you're listening to this. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a hyper-conservative uh, sect of the United Pentecostal Church. So we were not allowed to okay. wear shorts, play sports, listen to music, go to the movies. We called the TV the Hellivision. Um, and so Hello. when oh. the hell, well, I haven't yeah. thought of that yet. It's 2020. Yeah. I, know, right? I thought to call it that. Go ahead. Yeah, Those good. guys are innovators. Daryl. Yeah, yeah, I know. Listen, we had some really <laughs> bad jokes, really bad jokes, um, yeah. but it blew my mind when I found out, cause I, I wasn't allowed to go to sports games and stuff as a kid. So when I found out what people were making like legitimately, and, and I grew up in poverty. So my entire <laughs> yeah, worldview yeah. of how money grew up very also well. was like, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very, uh, very, very shifted, I guess is what I would say. Like I, I, it blew my mind and I couldn't understand how this was possible. And someone really just like informed me of the attention economy and the idea that like it, it's a certain value of just having eyeballs. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really fascinating to me. And it's hilarious because as I began to unpack the way the advertising industry works and like soaps, like literally film and television, TV started just to sell you dish soap. Yeah, that's like literally yeah. <laughs> why they're called the soaps. The and, soaps. and it's so yep. interesting to me because everybody's acting like there's this, this new thing that's happening with AVOD and free TV uh, and it's advertising supported. And you're like, oh, this is like you said, contraction and expansion. This is the bundling and unbundling effect. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the attention economy really blew my mind. And when I understood that there was power in the eyeballs, that's when I really realized how much value there was on social media because it is truly right. the ability to own your audience. And it blows my mind that filmmakers don't know how to monetize. They can, filmmakers can have 7 million followers because they're freaking amazing. And, and everybody wants to know what they're eating for breakfast. And they don't know how to market their movie to the point that they can get someone, a distributor to yeah. pay for it. And it's not that filmmaker's fault. It's the distributors because it's the distributor's job to market that film. And they don't know how to connect with that online audience because they're so disconnected because... To Nick's point earlier, they're too busy looking at the economic I think impact. Nick's a, I, I think well, Nick's a know, genius because he brought he might up how be. genius you guys are at Segways. <laughs> you brought up two things I want to say. First of all, advertising. Every business is based on ads, Nick. 
You have to, so yeah, whoever yeah. creates the next big thing has to figure out how to make money without being dependent on the ads because the P and A is what makes movies so expensive part, yes, partially yeah. and the rest of the industries follow. The real, real truth is in 2024, why the hell does it cost $10 million to make a movie like American fiction? And That's by the right. way, kudos to American fiction, kudos to anatomy of a fall Kudos yeah. to Rustin. I think it's so funny and ironic that the movies people are talking about this year are just simple human stories. Yeah. People yeah. now Oppenheimer is going to win everything and maybe diver, uh, um, deservedly. So uh, Barbie was a big bonanza. They spent the money to get the money. That's all good. But these movies that people love and come back to like the holdovers. Yeah. Like Rustin who Coleman Domingo should win. He, he was awesome uh, for male actor. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, or Jeffrey Wright in, in American fiction or anatomy of a fall. These are just human stories with a camera point. why does it cost so much If technology was Moore's law, man. Technology yeah. was supposed to relieve us of the yeah. expense. It was supposed to be a downward slope. Instead, it's an upward slope. It's a hockey stick yeah. of expense. It, it, it makes no sense. I mean, I tell this all the time. People, I said, film has gotten more expensive. You know, one of the most expensive films of all time back when this industry started was Howard Hughes. I don't know if you've seen The Aviator yeah, uh, with yeah, Leo or if you just know the story of Howard Hughes. That man spent $2 million, which was a lot back then. If you adjust that for inflation, we're, we're, but, but he was literally inventing airplanes. He was inventing yeah. new kinds of planes that they put cameras on so they could take you know film of other planes. Like that was unheard of. We didn't even have commercial travel back then. So I'm like, right. of course the man spent $2 million. Now that was bonkers then, but mm -hmm. if you actually adjust for inflation, we're still spending more today on films <laughs> right. and we have drones and we have amazing technology. And so you're yes. like, so exactly. Moore's law should go like this in terms of costs, but in reality, we're going like this in terms of costs on yes, films and it man. makes no sense, no, no, but it actually has less to do with the technology yeah. has more to do with the economics and our outside counsel, Sky Moore at Greenberg Gluster, shout out, um, represents <laughs> some of the best in the business. He wrote an amazing book called The Biz. Okay, and, write that um, down. Also, yeah. it's it's a book that's it's I would highly recommend it for any filmmaker. Read it. It's going to be a deep dive into the economics, the law, uh, just the social, the norms, the inner workings of the industry. Because some of it isn't legal. Some of it, not that it's illegal. It's, it has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with <laughs> economics. It just right. is. There are things that we do in film that we just do because we do it, and it, sometimes it doesn't make any sense, and people just go, "Well, that's how it is," right? <laughs> but, right. but one of them is that we have created, and this was really Netflix that introduced it. Um, with buying out worldwide rights in perpetuity is that there was no more, mm. there's no more backend. It's a one-time right, payout. Right. So, yep. so the monetization ends there. It's a snapshot in time. And if Netflix says it's worth 5 million now and you sell it for 5 million, no one on that team is making another dollar from that film. That's right. it. Yep. So that deal better and be a damn good deal. And they also don't price it very well because they don't have any data to predict how well it's going to do. So it's very subjective. And so that film might go on to make a billion dollars over its lifetime and you got 1% of 5 million, right? right? Pre and now, now that's a great deal. So. <laughs> it is a great right, deal. <laughs> right, right. And that's a great yeah. deal. I was like, that Again. actually doesn't happen that often. And so they shifted yeah. the economics to this one where everybody goes, well, since I'm never going to see any back end, I might as well ask her as much as I can now. And that's also right. we have this historical thing that we do that everybody else in the world thinks is insane, except for us, that the bigger <laughs> the budget, the better the movie. That is not true <laughs> at, right. at all. <laughs> yes, exactly. It doesn't make it a better movie. This it doesn't make it a more prestigious movie. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and, no, I, and exactly, I guess exactly. I just have to. I got to get back to to Daryl's statement, though, and that gets yeah, back jump to in, Nick. I know your head's going to explode. Yeah, yeah my, exactly. <laughs> my the industry versus business thing is like, you know, this the statement that you made is like, you know, the the distributors are failing filmmakers, right? And my perspective, unfortunately, I think is the the reality, which is they're not. They're in it for themselves. The totally contract different business model, that right? Nick? For themselves, yeah. it is like, like that's right. Read the they're contract. a part of the industry. That's fair. That's exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's it's all they're, exploited. Yeah. That, that's yes, fair. and that's the thing. Yeah. So that's the part the filmmakers. So the real thing that I want to know, and, and I guess we we do really got to get to Papa Bear and things we should know. Yeah. But like Chris said, like we could do this all day. The thing is, this guys like literally build all this stuff. We could do what we do. How do we really get the filmmakers to listen to this? to understand this at large. Like this distributor yeah. thing isn't one or two distributors, right? Yeah. It might be 95% of them. So, but 95% of filmmakers don't seem to know this. 
So what is the platform that we need to create, right? We could do this together, right? We're, we have the same mission. What is the platform we need to create to let them know it, right? To let them know it just like you're supposed to have three-point lighting, right? Let them know it like the certain type of camera is the best type of camera. And the, like, what is the thing that we need to do to let people know yeah. by like, yeah. fundamentally I mean, I, I, that this I is- I think for us, we have to show people that's what, you know, like, as you said, you know, we could say we're going to go fix the old thing. I mean, we really said no. Right. Yeah, we, right. we have to operate within an industry as it is, right? We, Daryl and I have to be experts at doing that, and we are. How do you operate within a world where there are sales agents and distributors and production companies and studios and all the different watch windows and all the different rights and territories, which, by the way, doesn't even make sense anymore because we have the internet and the internet doesn't have borders. That's a whole other topic. Right. <laughs> but, but so we still have to say, okay, that's where everybody's at. It's like the Overton window. We're here. Yep. They're still here. Because yeah. the way we see the world is one in which you have a film and you have tools that can take it out to the world. And at the end of the day, it will be judged on the value of its part. And you know what? There are some terrible rom-coms that my mom loves and watches on repeat <laughs> over and over that's and over right. again. And that's okay. But it, it, the point is, if the film can find its target audience, that's a success. Now, is every film going to make a billion dollars? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, every film should be able to find its audience. And hopefully, okay. time and time again, that will convert to be a, a proper economic equation where it is a profitable one. Where at the end of the day, because our system is built on technology and data, you know that if you go create this goofy rom-com and only 100,000 fans are going to find it because it's weird and wacky and the old, the max you're ever going to make on it is $2 million, well then you probably shouldn't spend $50 million making it, right? right. You yeah. probably should just be more <laughs> purposeful in the way you go about it, right? So, and so, so for smart, us, Austin. it is, we want people to know that Kino is where you go to launch films, just like Amazon is where you go to shop. Or if you're a seller, Amazon's where I go to sell. You know, at the end of the day, you know, Tesla is is where you go to buy electric cars. But now there's four and there's other places. But but for us, we want it to become a household name for producers. Yeah, Kino's my launch pad. That's where I go. Just like I might take it to physical theaters, but when I'm ready to hit the internet, I go to Kino first. And then I'm gonna go sell it to Netflix or Disney or Hulu or whoever else. Because we have all the tools. If we're just the place, so you don't have an again, exclusive. You don't have an exclusive fans. contract. Darryl we don't Austin? buy. We don't buy out. We're an exhibitor, right. just like a theater. Okay, so, so we don't yeah, buy so, out your rights. We yeah. are obsessed with making your film hit millions of fans online, and then I want you to take it and window it at Netflix and window it at two. Go all the places. Pluto, yeah. Because that's how a, a successful film is one that goes through multiple iterations of its life cycle. Yeah. While it's hot and heavy launch it in a theatrical, launch it in our, we are a digital theatrical window, launch it on Kino, capture fans. We give the fans the most magical experiences of film. Then once it starts to get that global recognition, take it off that limited watch window, get a great deal with Netflix. And then it lives in a beautiful library. And then maybe after that 10 year contract expires, go put it on AVOD, just like we used to syndicate and put things on yeah, linear, it's, right? It's, so it's then it can make some exciting. ad revenue. Yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. I don't think the industry has, I think it's still got a sprained ankle from, from Netflix being successful, uh, right? Because yeah. that, what Netflix did was it stole an exhibition window. That's right. That was well, so, we, so meaningful to the industry yeah. and to the yeah, yeah. producers and actors and everybody in the waterfall. And on top of that, at the same time, we killed the home entertainment market, which was a huge chunk that we yeah. still haven't figured out. That's what well. I mean. Yeah, so yeah. It was like a yeah. one-two punch yeah. for us. In the music business where I started, you would, and this is mostly for you, Daryl, because in, in a way, because you've been on this side where you've had to be an arbiter and a curator of good taste. You have to know the difference between good and bad. You have to understand that even if it's not for you, did, do they have a skill? Yeah. Did you do something skillful? I had this debate with one of our buddies this, today. Like, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. Do you, do you know the difference between good and bad? We Are you know talking that. about Daryl's dating life? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, <I'm> just... <laughs> so, so here's the wide deal. open, it, guys. Let's have it. <laughs> let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just talk about it. Let's get right. out here. Um, in music, they have showcases, and showcases filtered out the bottom eighty percent effectively every time. Mm -hmm. And every time I was in a singing group, and every time we'd go to a showcase, it'd be the same groups. Uh, so I had a singing group for four guys named, and we, we were called Solace. And every time we would go to a showcase, it would always be the same artists over and over and over again, especially artists in the top 20% that would make it past the first round or second round. And so every state you'd go to every city, yes, there'd be different people, but the same top 20% would show up is what I'm saying. Is there a way to do that in film? 
is there a way to mm-hmm. sort of because one of the frustrations is 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 and 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 the truth is you know when we were doing consulting regularly and and note giving and 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 sort of actively looking for films to produce we were getting hundreds of scripts right and yep. 90% plus of them are were really bad or just yeah. not good enough. I think that's a generous. I think ninety percent is very generous if you're yeah, if you're being real. You know, like that's yeah. 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 Plus. And some of them from people that I know are super talented. And like like mm-hmm. like they do other things that are great. And I'm like, ooh, that this just that's not good writing. Um, yep. So writing is really hard. Storytelling is really hard. Um, but a lot of the people who feel disenfranchised in the industry, which we've been talking about over the expanse of this episode and this conversation, is like those people may not be talented enough to be on your app, for example, right? Like, how do you, how do can we do that? Can we create a showcase? And then how do you guys curate what you will accept and won't accept onto the app for distribution? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a free for all? I mean, we, we we did just do a short film fest. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a showcase. Um, We did a people's choice award. So that way people can vote on it and people might love something that statistically is technically not sound. Mm. It might have been terrible writing, but people just thought it was the funniest thing ever, yeah, or just yeah. the weirdest thing ever, or the coolest thing ever. So we had a People's Choice Award, and we did Judge's Choice Award with amazing filmmakers, writers, directors, actors who know what they're talking about, who who reviewed it, right? Um, and that was a beautiful process. Um, and that was digital. So you could have hundreds of thousands of people vote for your short film online, which helps augment the kind of thing that we see at a Sundance, right? Like Sundance is great for having a concentrated effort of experts in the industry that are reviewing. It's not great for having necessarily, you know, the masses look at it and vote for that. Right. I think we'll continue. Plus it's a market. Um, to, to, yeah, yeah, it's a market. Yeah. And, and, and we'll continue to, to, to scale up our, our short film fest to continue to support and empower emerging filmmakers you, or filmmakers that want to get their work out there. Um, how do you do it though, Austin? Like how do you, how do you manage and curate the people's choice? Right. Can can yeah. people go in and because on social media, like, you know, there's bot armies, there's there's like, you know, Taylor Swift fans, there's yeah. the beehive, yeah. there's right. all these there's people who can game it. Yeah. Yeah. If they I join think, together. I think one in, idea in, in, it was gonna say, simply in our app, you have to be a member and you have to be a paying yeah. member. So if you're gonna gamify that and, and you're gonna you're gonna buy up a thousand accounts and <laughs> and you're gonna pay for that, I mean like we're we're gonna be able to figure that out pretty quickly. But what about like a Reddit situation where where the whole AMC deal and and um those people were just people who decided they would form a group together and, and collaborate? I mean, that is the power of the digital online community. I think I think that what you're describing, at least from my perspective, is kind of a twofold problem. One okay. is how do we get emerging artists into jobs where they can get the training that they need and deserve to develop a skill set and actually mm-hmm. incorporate it into an industry or better yet, a bunch of businesses. Um, right. That is a that is a <laughs> different pipeline and a different issue than I think the showcase issue. And I, you know, right. we've we've seen several versions of this that's tried to come out like blacklist. And I think that those are interesting, right. yeah. really interesting solutions. Um, at the end of the day, I think that that is an important issue. It's not the the thing that we're focused on right now. You know that there are gotcha. an infinite number of problems to solve. I think with technology as the solution, which is great, because that yeah. if our mission is equitability and efficiency and engagement, we're going to be able to check all of these boxes at some point, but it's a, it's a long journey. And so, um, I don't, truthfully, I don't think I've put enough time and effort and energy thinking about how to solve this in a thoughtful way. So I could give you some bullshit answer that might sound really <laughs> nice. Um, right. but at the end of the He's day, like, but then like, I'd be one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So like I'm focused and, and Austin is too right now. Our, our 25 meter target, if I'm using the military analogy, the thing we are laser yep. focused on is fixing the sales and distribution pipeline. And as soon okay. as that's taken okay. care of, we're going to move to the next target. And I think that's an interesting thing. I just, I don't think I've spent enough time, you know, really trying to solve that problem to give a, an informed decision. Well, I, 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 well, they're, they're, they're connected. They're connected because yeah. I view your app as a, a festival. And as a market in and of itself. Yeah. You know, in some ways, I mean, that we, is. We, we need great supply. You know, at the end of the day, by, if we're, we're going to be distributing film and TV, we, we constantly need amazing new film and TV. And, 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 and we want to be always working with the new, the newest, coolest, most amazing films, filmmakers, 
plus those veterans and experienced folks. So, so it is something we think about critically is the supply of our platform mm-hmm. is something that we need to foster carefully. And that yeah. doesn't just mean you keep going back to the same production companies and producers and actors. Yes, continue to foster them. But at the end of the day, you know, we also want to make sure that emerging filmmakers are there. I think there's also, um, I, th- I think education in film and TV, again, it's a little bit over a hundred year old industry. Uh, education mm-hmm. in film and TV is so nascent, right? You know, I, I'm very lucky to have gone to USC. Um, I went to the law school at USC. I didn't go to the film school, but I have many mm-hmm. friends who went to the film school. Incredible program. But like you can count on one hand, Daryl went to LMU, also incredible program right mm-hmm. behind USC. And but the reality is that you know you can kind of count on one hand the amount of film schools that probably do credibly train writers in the right way and and, and like producing teach like, people barely know how to teach that at all right. you know yep. and yep. Like, people like, barely no, know how to no, do that it, yeah. it's yeah. really <laughs> you know it's, it's so true like you have MBAs right we have law degrees we have, all these other industries have these amazing processes to get trained frankly, to the point where it's like, you, you, you stop it. You don't need to get trained anymore. But in film and TV, it's like, we, we just don't have enough and it's not accessible. That's the other thing too, right? Not everyone, like I, I feel incredibly lucky to be a kid from Ohio who was able to go to law school at USC. Most of my friends never even had the chance to get anywhere close to that. Mm, and right. if they wanted to go into film and TV, they, they, they no chance they would have ever gotten into one of those big schools, right? And I'm not saying that it has to even be a formal education, but just, you know, the reality is, like you said, so many people get inspired and want to create the stories, but there is actually, there's a function and a form to it that also needs to be taught to some degree. Not saying you can't be self-taught, but that is something I think about quite a bit too, is there's an education gap in this industry, you know? Yep, agreed. Writing I, is I hard, learned how to write. I yeah. can't write. Daryl can. <laughs> I, I learned how to write by buying books while I was in the army and I kept a screenwriting book in my cargo pocket and I bet I read a hundred books, you know, but that's the, yeah. the homeschooled nerd, <laughs> awesome, you know, just dude. like, that's awesome. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting thing because I would say even the formalized programs that are really great and, and supposed to give opportunities to those who have been marginalized historically, there's not a good pipeline to put them into work. There's these programs right. that exist to even yeah. educate you. But even if you have the education, there is a huge difference between writing and, and producing like I did in film school and writing and producing like I did in Vancouver uh, the next semester. You know what I mean? Like it was right. a very yep. different world. And that reality is very tough. And I think that we need a program. We used to have these great mentorships and we used to have a system where you'd come in and you'd work as a PA and then a cam op. And, you know, the next thing you knew, you were you were actually a DP and you're shooting and, and you have a skill set you built over time. Even though there's a huge volume of work, we've lost the real funnel to get people the experience that they need, which is part of the problem, too, is because it takes a a lot of experience to be able to be a professional storyteller. And there's no methodology right now to help people learn and grow, especially when it comes to like short films. It blows my mind. Like we can monetize this content in a better way than we're doing. We just haven't put the effort and energy into doing it. And the opportunities that we'll create gives, it gives a young filmmaker a chance to come in and learn and de-risk his learning process. Because that's the other thing is like, you have to put in the reps. Whoever can solve that too. If you guys solve the short film problem, Man, Bro, you, we're you guys testing are make some money. ideas. You We've guys got yeah. money hand over yeah. fist. I've downloaded. They're the thinking app. about it. it you know, they're phone. thinking about it. It's a five star app. Kudos, to you guys. And 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 Nick, I know you want to ask some questions before we roll, but just on the yeah. short film thing, the thing I hate is that Google and YouTube make so much money off these short filmmakers because they don't pay you until you have ten thousand subs, but yeah, they run okay. ads on you the whole time. The whole time, and, so and getting you know all the ad pay, revenue. You no, know who has ten thousand subs for one short film? Yeah, they don't have the, it. Yeah, and they only pay five dollars per thousand views. Yeah, we we, right. we have some folks that submitted to our short film festival that also posted on YouTube prior to Kino, um, and, and they had millions of views, and they they made less than what we were offering in prize money to them because you make five per right. thousand, so you get a million views, yeah. you're getting five thousand dollars, right? Like that's and if we're being real, if we're being real, Tubi's not that much better. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you're up here, you're talking about fractions of a penny per viewer. If you're in the AVOD space, like this is yeah. not a, this is not a fair monetization. And again, no. it's because yeah. it's an industry. It's because people who are yeah. trying to extract the maximum amount of value possible instead of infuse their offerings with value. Sorry, I cut you off, Austin. No, no, no. I mean, the, the point was really just that at the end of the day, these are not invalid channels. 
it's just about like I kind of went to my point before, we have to make choices as humans now. We have so much technology, we have so much optionality. We now need to decide, are we going to be mission driven? Are we going to be purpose driven? Are we going to look out for one another? Uh, you know, and also win-win economics. It can be about me and be about you at the end of the day. And that is very valid. And actually, if you look you know, into a lot of historical examples, win-wins are the ones that actually ultimately prevail over win-loses. Win-loses, like I said before, tend to be corrosive. Yeah, and so something like that. Yeah. Something like a, a YouTube or a Tubi, I don't think they're invalid platforms, but should that, that be the first place that you put your short film that people no. see when it's hot and new? No, that should probably be where it goes yeah. to retire. And then it generates some ad revenue or something. You and, know? And, and to my well, point earlier, Austin, if it's really good, if it's really good, yeah. that can't be your first place. You yeah. put it because, yeah. like you said, if it's if it's hot, new, and really good, you, you've just shot yourself in yeah. the foot, right? Yeah. 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 So let me, Absolutely. so before we, yeah, before Nick, we wrap yeah, up, yeah, yeah, gonna, bring, bring us home. Nick. Same, you, yeah. Yeah, well, What's one on of, your mind? One of the things that I was, you know, you know I got stuff on my mind, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm always thinking about something and then these guys get me excited about what's going on, you know? So I'm excited, man. I'm excited for Keno. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm hot. I'm like, I'm wearing a sweatshirt. What was I thinking? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Austin's pulling his, you know, pulling the Adam Newman on me over here. I'm like ready. Yeah. To yeah. But, but here's, Here's the thing. Why are so, money? My, yeah, yeah. My hair's my hair's not long <laughs> enough yet to make that reference. But You're right. <laughs> yeah. So so here so here's the deal. So what I was thinking was it's like the relationship that filmmakers have with you could say the industry and or with these streaming services is basically an abusive relationship. Yep. People stay in these relationships for whatever reason, right? Some of them is that's just all I know. Um, Are you some talking them, about my dating life now? Is that what we're see, <laughs> see, <laughs> you're right. We're back to segue. this again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like some of them is like some people think that's all I deserve, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you, you've heard those stories, right? That's all I deserve is this. Yeah, some of them are like, yeah. well, he or she is a good breadwinner, or he or she is good to me when they're mm-hmm. good to me, mm-hmm. right? They don't know anything yeah, else, yeah. and I think that's what this is. The only reason that, well, I'm going to say the only reason, one of the primary reasons we see or hear about why people stay in these relationships is because they're not familiar with anything better. They're not familiar with the possibility that there's something out there that would serve them better, right? And I think that's it. I think that's where filmmakers are. Why do they put their stuff on you? Why do you put a short on YouTube? It's because of what every filmmaker tells us. You mm-hmm. cannot monetize a short film. Yeah, that's it. Not yeah. that. Not that they have not found a way. No one ever right. says I haven't found a way. Mm-hmm. Right. That means you know that's different from saying you cannot. That's an absolute. That's the issue. The absolutes that the filmmakers absolutely believe need to be destroyed, and I think that's where you guys come in. It's like, look, we're going to show examples of the person you can date that is not going to abuse you. Here's yeah. the person you can date that is not going to take advantage of you. And yeah. when that word gets out, and I'm telling you guys, like I know that you mentioned going to film festivals, that's where you have to be, right? Whether you're physically there or virtually there, mm-hmm. if you can have your voice at all of these film festivals mm-hmm. where these filmmakers are, then they will be introduced even for a moment to the possibility of something better. That is the spark, right? That's the thing. That's the red pill. Yeah. And I, that's <laughs> hey, that's, that's where they need to I be. loved it. That was a great call. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's true. And I think that, you know, the, our basic thesis as media tech founders is that automated software, removing the friction and pain out of bringing your film to the heights of success. The reality is that automated software is very cheap once it's built. And this is why we have gone and raised millions of dollars from amazing tech investors that we can go build the platform and build the software to then allow for that to persist the success of filmmakers. And then we actually take the lowest distribution fee in the industry. Because at the end of the day, we, we, we've we had some investors go, well, you should charge more. Other people do it. <laughs> We're not other right, people. Of course. We're not other people. We're looking to be the place that every filmmaker knows this is where I can launch my film, right? At the end of the day. And like you said, you know, we're going to, we, we have to what, maintain what is, what is the, fee? the app and all of that. But uh, we take 30%. We give 70%. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we don't, we don't have any sort of uh, hidden fees. We don't have any sort of Hollywood accounting. It's a mm-hmm. very, very simple. 
And we're um, also adding in the marketing value and giving you the value of that yeah, data. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. data is, I think, like if you understand what it means to market a film and you've tried to do this yourself, especially if you've ever four walled yeah. or you've ever tried to run and you said, F it, I'm going to load it up onto, you know, all these EST AVOD platforms myself. Yeah. Yeah. And you've tried to promote, you know how hard that is. That's a very yeah. difficult. So people just don't market and yeah. you, that's not an option either. Yeah, it's just no, no, competitive. No, no. It's a red ocean. Money that way. <laughs> yeah, there's so much. Yeah. There's so much noise on the internet. I mean, like there are cool parts of our app too that people will never notice and see. But our data infrastructure is ten times cheaper because of the way that it's been built, purpose driven. That allows for us that you know at some point thirty percent might be too high, and we have to reduce that. Mm -hmm. But we are still able to offer the highest margins in our business model because our tech is just that much more efficient. Like efficiency is not a sexy word. You're like, why is that part of your mission? Because efficiency <laughs> right. means that actually we can then transfer that value that That's we right. have redeemed out of efficiency and technology to the ultimate end users, the filmmakers and the fans. And yes, we make profit out of that by being the supplier of that value. But it is really at the end of the day because we are servicing people, not because we are just looking at spreadsheets and trying to maximize numbers. It's because we're saying, hey, filmmaker, yeah, there are these five things that you do that are really expensive, one of which is marketing. And if you could reduce the cost of that by 10x, what would that do for you? Oh, yeah. wow. You'd probably be able to yeah. make a bunch of profitable movies. The very fact that we have to store your videos online is not cheap in the old system, but our new technology is so much cheaper. So, oh, guess what? We don't have to bake into your contract all these extra fees. We don't have to take this high of a you know, of a distribution fee, we can actually make it really simple and make it one of the lowest in the industry. Great. You know, it's just things like that, that again, go back to our mission. And that's the difference between a mission driven company and an idea driven company. We've had a lot of amazing tech companies that have been founded off of ideas. What if I could just press a button on my phone and, and, and a taxi would be delivered to me? Uber, great idea, revolutionized humanity. So cool. But guess what? It did leave a lot of pain in its wake. The whole taxi industry had to figure it out. And there's yeah. nothing good or wrong or bad or anything. It just is. It happened, right? Yeah. Same thing with Netflix. What if I could just sit down and subscribe and see every movie ever? That is really cool. It's such a cool idea. And it did a lot of things for our industry, but it also did have impact in ways that now we as tech founders need to look back and say, okay, yeah, you proved you could do that. But also, what if we did this? And what if it was better? And that's where we're looking towards. Yeah. Hey, I guess I got, I, got, I got something for you. And then we got to, I know we got to wrap. Yeah. I'm just thinking about this. Ready for this? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know you guys are waiting, right? <laughs> We're a filmmaking company with no collateral damage. <laughs> Look, I want to just take that and clip that. I'm just going to take that, that audio soundbite. Please email that to me afterwards. And that's, <laughs> no that's going to open our pitch. That's open it. our pitch yep. to the VCs. Is that the and, Jamie and, Fox and like movie? Collateral you, damage. You simplify, yeah, you simplify the whole mm -hmm. thing, yep. right? Just like Chris said, you simplify the whole thing. You take it and take take parts out you don't need. The answer is no collateral damage. Yeah, and it, you just delete, 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 and because the genius is in the simple. It doesn't matter if it's complex yep. underneath, right? Like I used to work for a SaaS company, and you know the SaaS once you build it, it's, it's built, and everything else is yep. profit side and. And all the elegance is in the fact that you can prevent present a UI, right? And then and then create a UX, a user experience that that is is very simple and intuitive, and you don't understand that so much is powering uh, that that UX yeah. UI b behind yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think I think it's a brilliant place to stop, man. And uh, yeah. I tell you what, here's here's what we'll try for the audience. We have a short film that we did, and it and it did it did make a festival. <laughs> And we've Christine, not released it. We've I just am. chosen. We've just chosen not to release it. So it's never been released outside of the festival it was in. And we will send it to you guys. And let's see what okay. it does. Let's see how it does. And um, case study style. Yeah, it's not, it's it's not to me. To me, the filmmakers are great. I love all the filmmakers. We were supporting a first time filmmaker when when it was made. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's it's good, not great, but it is good. And yep. um, we'll we'll see what happens. So that'll be a good place to start. We'll do a little case study in real time with you guys. Uh, with that, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, where they can find you on the internet, where they can download your app, see some of your work, et cetera? Yeah. yeah at absolutely. Kino Makes Movies on all social channels. At Kino, K-I-N-O, Makes Movies on all socials. Kino.studio 
is the URL for those of you that utilize browsers. For those of you that have a Roku enabled TV or a Roku native TV, we are on Roku. We are coming very soon to Fire Stick for all you Fire Stick folks, Apple TV for all you Apple TV folks. And for those of you that are weird and use Samsung and Vizio and all that, we're getting to you. That'll happen soon. Um, and then you can download our mobile app on the Apple App Store. Uh, and for those of you who are also weird and have Android operating systems, we are coming to you soon on Android. But for right now, at Kino Makes Movies on socials, give us a follow. Kino.studio is the URL, and you can download it on Roku and the Apple App Store. Boom. And anywhere people can find you guys directly if they wanted to reach out, DM you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Email you. LinkedIn is always great. Um, you sketchy LinkedIn messages, DM guys. Me. It works. I, they do. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> sketchy LinkedIn messages <laughs> sketchy. are my love language. Um, <laughs> or at Austin C. Worrell on Instagram. Um, yeah. At Daryl Fannin. The best two is you Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, at- Guys, this was amazing. I really appreciate uh, appreciate everything. Well, we have to do a round two. I have so many bullets yeah. written down. I just know it's not it's not the time uh, to do it. Uh, you know, I, I looked down to see how long we had been talking. I'm like, oh crap, this went by fast <laughs> because we're just yeah. having such a good time. So I really appreciate you. I know I speak for the producers. I speak for Nick as well. Like you guys are amazing guests. We would have you back anytime for round two, yep. three, four, whatever. Absolutely. And uh, we'll keep track of the success and and the progress. And we'll get back to this audience on, on how things are going with our own little personal case study I just announced. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on X at Flame in Your Heart. Your is spelled with U R, or you can just search my name, Chris Barkley, and I will come right up. I'm a fun follow. Uh, if you want to reach out to Nick, you can find him on Reddit at Nicholas Bugs. Uh, he has a whole like thing he's doing there with Q and A. And if you have like a question for us or for Daryl or for Austin, shoot him a question at his Reddit page or at his Reddit handle. And he will bring it up on this very podcast and we'll be able to address your questions and he'll answer you on the app as well. If you want to email him and tell him the history of Hillman College, you can do that <laughs> at Nick at Bonsai.film. Yes, his personal email, Nick at Bonsai.film. He's a brave man. If you want to find anything about the Make It podcast, it's really easy. Wherever you go on the internet, just search for the Make It podcast and we will pop right up, including on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, you name it. You'll find us there. Last but not least, we have a bi-weekly newsletter. It's a passion project. We love doing it. We find the stuff you won't find in film all across the internet and the world, including insider stuff that uh, gets fed to us through the channels that you literally will not find on the internet. So do subscribe. That's bonsai.film forward slash subscribe. So bonsai.film forward slash subscribe, or you can go to bonsai.film and then click newsletter in the top right corner. It's just your email address. We don't sell it. We don't do anything. And it doesn't cost you anything. It's completely free. So with that, Nick, can you please leave us with the credo? Of course. And I, too, will put all the bullets to the side for the next conversation <laughs> because this passion and this excitement is palpable in this room. And honestly, guys, I wasn't, you know, you could say that in, in the beginning there was a little bit of jest in the hug. But I'm just telling you, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's amazing when you find kindred spirits in this industry. One that for us, we started this podcast because of the people who were not kindred spirits, right? So when you find folks like you, it's like, dude, we know folks are like this are out there and they're out there for the community. And we get so excited to literally have you on and have these conversations. So guys, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And with that, I definitely have to say to our friends, our family, our fans, our followers out there, be better, be creative, be engaged. And thank you for listening. Nick, Daryl, Austin, talk to you guys soon. Yes, sir. Yeah, chat soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Peace. Thanks, guys. I'll take it easy. Be good, guys. See ya. Peace. Peace. Peace.